नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नाम चरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जाया मुदीर ये नष्ट प्रायशु अभद्रेशु नित्यां भागवत सेवया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती न इष्टकी so reading today from verses 37 to 39 of the 10th canto chapter number 8 chapter entitled lord krishna shows the universal form we'll read text number 37 together sa tatra dadrshe vishwam जगत्स्तास्नो चकम दिशा साद्री द्विपाबिभुगोल स वाग्निंदूतरक सा त्र दृशे विश्वा जगत्स्तास्नो चकम दिशा साद्री द्विपादिभुगोल स वाग्निंदुतारक सा त्र दृशे विश्वा जगत्स्तास्नो चकम दिशा साद्री द्विपादिभुगोल स वाग्निंदुतारक सा त्र दृशे विश्वा जगत्स्तास्नो चकम दिशा ताद्रीदिपादी भूगोल द्रिविपाद्रिभुगोल सा त्र दृशे विश्वा जगत्सो चकम दिशा साद्री द्विपादिभुगोल स वायु अग्निंदुतारक सा त्र दृशे विश्वा चकम दिशा स 
ಸಾತಾತ್ರದೃಶೆ ವೈಶ್ವಾ ಜ್ಯೋತಿಶ್ಚಕ್ರಂಜಲಿಚಕ್ರ ಸಹ ಜೀವಕಾಲ ಸ್ವಭಾವಕರ್ಮಸಯಲಿಂಗೇದ ಶುನೋಸ್ತನೌವಿಕ್ಷಾರಿತ್ಮಾನಾಪಶಂಕ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಸ ಮದರ್ ಯಶೋಧ ತತ್ರಿನ್ ದ ವೈಡ್ ಓಪನ್ ಮೌತ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ದೃಶೆ ಸ ವಿಶ್ವ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಜಗತ್ moving entities stasnu maintenance of non moving entities cha and come the sky disha the directions sa adri with the mountains dwipa islands abdi and oceans bugolam the surface of the earth so why you with the blowing wind agni fire hindu the moon tarakam stars jyoti chakram the planetary systems jalam water tejaha light nabaswan outer space viyat the sky eva also cha and vaikara vaikara vaikar vaikarini khani creation by transformation of ahankar <coughs> indriyani the senses manaha mind matra sense perception gunatraya the three material qualities sattva rajas and tamas etat all these vichitram varieties saha along with jiva kala the duration of life of all living entities swabhava natural instinct karma ashaya resultant action and desire for material enjoyment linga bedam varieties of bodies according to desire suno tanu in the body of a sun vikshaya seeing vidarita asya within the wide open mouth vrajam rindavan dham nanda maharaj's place saha atmanam along with herself a vapa was struck shankam with all doubts and wonder translation and purport by his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami sila prabhu pad translation when krishna opened his mouth wide by the order of mother yashoda she saw within his mouth all moving and non moving entities outer space and all directions along with mountains islands oceans the surface of the earth 
the blowing wind, fire, the moon and the stars. She saw the planetary systems, water, light, air, sky and creation by transformation of ahankar. She also saw the senses, the mind, sense perception and the three qualities, goodness, passion and ignorance. She saw the time allotted for the living entities. She saw natural instinct and the reactions of karma. And she saw desires and different varieties of bodies moving and non-moving. Seeing all these aspects of the cosmic manifestation along with herself and Vrindavan Dham, she became doubtful and fearful of her son's nature. Popat. All the cosmic manifestations that exist on the gross and subtle elements as well as the means of the agitation, the three gunas, the living entity, creation, maintenance, annihilation and everything going on in the external energy of the Lord, all this comes from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Govinda. Everything is within the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 9.10 Maya Dekshena Prakriti Suyate Sa Characharam. Everything in the material nature, Prakriti, works under his direct control. Because all these manifestations come from Govinda, they could all be visible within the mouth of Govinda. Quite astonishingly, Mother Yashoda was afraid because of intense materna maternal affection. She could not believe that within the mouth of her son such things could appear. Yet she saw them and therefore she was struck with wonder. She was struck with fear and wonder. <clears throat> Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksharon Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guruve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadanti Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajata Sagana Ragunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Pada Sagana Lalitam Sri Vishakan Vitam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namosute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Vaneshwari Vrishabano Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadar Sri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna <clears throat> Seeking the blessings of all the devotees to be able to say something on this text and purport by Sila Prabhupada. <clears throat> so we see over here that Lord Krishna, in this form as a small child, has now opened his mouth wide just to reciprocate with the love of his mother. <clears throat> and his mother sees so many different things moving and non-moving within the mouth of baby Krishna and um, after seeing all this 
Mother Yashoda becomes fearful. And we have been seeing over the last so many days, so many different pastimes of Lord Krishna as a small child. And each and every one of them create a sense of fear in the Lord, in, in, the, in the mind of Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, particularly Mother Yashoda. And uh, Srila Prabhupada was giving a class in Vrindavan on the Nectar of Devotion series of lectures. And Srila Prabhupada is explaining that this particular emotion of fear, which is actually subordinate to love, can be so powerful, particularly when the person in relation to that fear is the one that you love. Which means that if there is a person whom you love so much, much more than your own life, then anything in relation to that person actually evokes fear in your heart. Like we see just in the previous pastime of Trinavarta, demon taking away Lord Krishna. So Mother Yashoda had baby Krishna on her lap and she was actually uh, feeding him. And uh, all of a sudden she found that baby Krishna was becoming heavier and heavier. <clears throat> and then, you know, she, getting bewildered and again getting peer, fearful, she just kept baby Krishna down on the ground and then she invoked the blessings of Lord Narayan upon baby Krishna and then she went about to do her duties. And then when Trinavarta came and of course Lord Krishna wanted to experience a wonderful ride up in the sky, so he became extremely light so that Trinavarta could carry him up. And there was such a fierce dust storm that was created that nobody was able to see anything. And then Yashoda, for a short time, she was completely blinded by the dust that was created. And then when she saw the place where baby Krishna had been kept, she saw that baby Krishna was not there. And then she started wailing so piteously, you know, just like how a cow had lost its calf. And similarly, when Lord Krishna goes into the uh, coils of the Kaliya serpent, also we see how Nanda Maharaj and uh, Mother Yashoda, they come on the banks of the river Yamuna and then they find that Lord Krishna, baby Krishna is there in the, uh, in the coils of Kaliya. And they are so much in this agony of fear for baby Krishna's uh, well-being. Uh, such an overpowering uh, emotion of um, fear in their heart. Just like last Sunday, Braj Bihari Prabhu was explaining that Mother Yashoda's love for baby Krishna was so intense that, you know, when, when uh, Krishna would go out into the pasturing grounds, she would not be able to bear to see Krishna going away along with his cowherd friends. And then as Krishna would be going, she would follow Krishna and then she would, uh, after Krishna had gone for some distance, she would call out to Krishna and then she would make Krishna come to him, come to her and then she would adjust Krishna's clothes and then she would bid again Krishna goodbye and then after some time, after he had gone some more distance, again she would call him back and then she would give him a little bit of prasad and again after he had left, again she would call him back and give him some pan to chew. So, Every moment that Mother Yashoda, Yashoda would be thinking that Lord Krishna is going to be going away from her, she would be feeling so much of intense separation. And that separation was coming out basically because she was so fearful that, you know, nothing should happen to Krishna. And that fear was coming out of her intense love. And we see that this particular thing, which is also there in human beings, to, uh, you know, I remember... Uh, several years back, in fact, more than 30 years back, you know, when we were staying in a place which was different from Bombay, we would come to Bombay in the summer vacations and uh, I would be staying in the house of my mother's sister and, who was staying in Chembur. 
and uh, my mother's sister was already married at that time for more than 20 25 years but then every time her husband would leave to the office in the morning she would be there at the door to bid him goodbye and not only that you know just outside the building he would come onto the main road and then from the main road he would take a small turn in order to go into the uh, highway and just at one particular spot I, I distinctly remember at one particular spot you know which was a, which is the last place from where his wife would be able to see him he would turn back and then wave his hand like this and then my auntie she would be so shy you know she would just wave her hand like this <laughs> she would not even raise her hand on top and they already married for 25 years and i used to wonder you know what is this you know this very special exchange of love taking place between and those are the days when we didn't have telephones and uh, you know or forget it, what to talk about mobiles i mean bombay also telephones were pretty rare so and i used to wonder why is it that you know and then throughout the day my auntie would be you know sort of meditating when her husband would be coming back and he would leave and in, you know he would leave at exactly the same time because he would catch exactly the same train from chembur to vt station because he worked in the same office for 59 years can you believe it he joined a company at the age of 16 and then at the age of 75 at the age of 60 he should have retired but they didn't allow him to retire so they made him continue and then he was working 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 till the age of 74 or 75 you know he was working in that company and finally he became you know quite old and then he couldn't go to his office so for nearly 58 59 years he was working and every day he would catch the same train monday to friday and he would catch the same train back so my auntie knew exactly what time he would come back you know it will be 10 minutes past 8 he has to be in the house you know she, that was something that he had followed for the last 25 years and if for any reason she was he was late she would be in so much anxiety you know, what happened to my husband and there was no way by which you could call him and you know the, the nearest telephone was maybe half a kilometer away and even if you know uh, something were to happen to him you know how would she ever get to know because you know the person who you know in case he makes an accident then they have to call up this telephone number and the person has you know in that house has to respond nowadays with mobile it's so easy you know you have it in the pocket it's ringing all the time but uh, in those days it was so difficult so for nearly i remember 40 years till they got a telephone in their house this exchange between them would take place you know and then much later one day i just happened to be talking to her and then i asked her you know what is it why was this particular you know small wave why was this happening every day you know so she told me that actually every day my husband would leave i would never I mean, I would feel that maybe he would never come back home, you know, because Bombay is such a place. You leave home and then you are never sure whether you're going to come back home or return back home. So, and she said that for the 12 hours that, you know, I would be in separation from him, that particular wave was what actually kept me going on throughout the day, you know. So such an intense emotion, you know, this love invokes in a person's heart, you know and uh, uh, it, it is manifest even in human beings so what to talk about the relationship between mother yashoda and the supreme personality of god to what extent you know so what rajbihari prabhu was telling us on sunday in the class was was absolutely something that we could all relate to you know mother yashoda did not want to lose sight of lord krishna even for a single second you know it was so painful to her heart that he would be going and then similarly when the when um, krishna would come back home then the cowherd boys would feel so much separation in their heart till the next day morning and then the moment they would get up they would they would brush their teeth and then they would have bath and then come straight to the house of mother yashoda so that they could once again associate with krishna so this was the intense mood of separation in both places you know morning to evening by mother yashoda and then from evening to next day morning by the cowherd boys so this, this um, uh, predominance of fear, which is actually very positive, it's a very positive uh, emotion. Now the emotion, is, uh, fear is, it's not a negative emotion, but it's a very positive emotion. So exactly the opposite of this is this 
um, negative emotion of fear, which you see more in this material world, you know, like uh, the fear of dying, uh, the fear of death is so strong in the hearts of every person because death is the final thing that is going to take away everything from you. And what to talk about now, you have millions and millions of years back, Hiranyakashipu, you know, we are going to be celebrating Narsingha Chaturdeshi in just a few days from now, a couple of days. So, we could just spend some time on this particular episode to highlight how it is that a person who actually was very well learned, learned, he was extremely well learned in the scriptures, uh, to such an extent when Hiranyaksha had been killed by Lord Varahadev, and all the family members were mourning the death of their husband, Vrishabhanu, that's a wife of Hiranyaksha, was mourning, and then the children, they were all, you know, in tremendous separation. Hiranyakashipu actually comes and starts um, preaching to this family and telling them that, you know, actually this body is temporary, you know, everybody has to die sooner or later. And then he gives so many different examples. He gives the example of this king by the name Suyagya and says that this particular king was lying on the battlefield dead and then his wives were not willing to let go of the body and the time that was prescribed for the body to be cremated was passing. And, um, you know, there was this, this wives were just not allowing the body to be taken away. And to such an extent that Yamaraj had to actually come in the form of a small child. And, you know, Yamaraj had to tell such uh, deep philosophy, you know. He, Yamaraj started saying that, you know, actually, I don't know why you all are crying like this. You know, actually the, the person whom you think is your husband is actually lying over here. So why are you crying? He's not gone anywhere. And so many other things, you know, uh, Yamaraj started saying to the wives of Suryagya and finally they uh, understood that they should actually be cremating the body of the king. So all this was being told by Hiranyakashipu to the relatives of Hiranyaksha. But then, immediately after that, he goes into this mood of austerities, performing austerities in order to become immortal. So on the one hand, he's telling all the relatives that, you know, this body is temporary, it is going to die in any case, and, you know, we all, you know, just like people who are staying in a hotel, we come together, in the morning, I mean, and then evening we are separated. Or just like, you know, twigs which come together when they are going on a river, and then, you know, after some time they are separated. I mean, this is very deep philosophy which we all use for our various preaching, uh, you know, as part of our preaching tools. And uh, Kirani Kashipu is telling all this, so, so basically he understood that, you know, this human form of life is, is, it is temporary and you have to die some point of time or the other. But then, when it comes to his own personal life, he is, he is trying his level best to become immortal. And then to, to what extent he does this austerities in order to become immortal. So this is uh, the fallacy that when, you know, we try to preach to others, we want to give them the philosophy, you know, as would be applicable to them. But then we don't want to apply that philosophy to our own lives. So it's a very typical example. <coughs> And similarly, the greater, another fear is the fear of losing our prestige or losing our position in society or position in the eyes of people, you know. Uh, I remember recently this uh, Krishna Chandra Prabhu was telling me that, um, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the outside world, in the upper eclions of society, there is such a deep competition, you know, just to be one on top of another, you know. So there is like, you know, most of us would not even have traveled by an by a aeroplane, you know. A lot of people in India wouldn't have traveled by an aeroplane. But among the upper eclions of society, to travel by an aeroplane, you know, is considered to be absolutely, uh, you know, third class. I mean, to, come, to travel by a commercial aeroplane, they would like to travel by their own aeroplane. You know, everybody would like to own their own aeroplanes. And when a person who reaches that particular stature, if he doesn't travel by, or 
if for some time he owns an aeroplane, the aeroplane is taken away from him, he's in so much intense separation, you know, there is so much of uh, frustration and depression, he goes into actually depression, you know, when he is, he's, I mean, he's got the facilities to travel by a normal commercial uh, uh, airplane, but, you know, because he was at one time owning his own plane and then now he has moved down in the scale, he's just not able to show his face. There is, you know, so much of um, feeling of separation when particularly something like that is taken away. So that's because the false ego gets so strongly affected. You know, all of us have that to a certain degree or the other, but then in the, uh, in, in the world outside, false ego is what actually drives people to compete with each other, to somehow the other try to get something that is better than what the other person has. And people push themselves to such an extent that, that they spend their whole life trying to achieve something. You know, it's actually a phantasmagoria, you know, that the whole uh, illusory world in trying to achieve something that you don't have just because something, somebody else has it. And this is the fear that is there so deep in the hearts of um, a materialistic person. Why is it that I am not possessing that, that what somebody else is possessing? So much of envy and consequent to that, there is so much of, you know, uh, feeling of inadequacy and, 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 uh, and, and depression. Why is it that I can't possess something that he has? And this fear is, it drives him to work harder and harder and harder and, and finally at the end, you know, the whole thing is so futile. But when a devotee sees that actually a person is struggling so hard in trying to fulfill whatever, you know, his inner desires, you know, to, to get more wealth or to get more prestige or to get more fame, a devotee is actually very compassionate. A devotee feels very uh, much pitiful. He feels, you know, why is it that this person is striving so hard? What is the whole point? <coughs> And he feels a deep sense of compassion to that person, you know. So, it's, so in the materialistic society, everybody is envying each other. Uh, but in, but when a devotee sees how a person who is chasing all this material uh, desires of his, a devotee actually pities such a person. Because the devotee realizes that to whatever extent he may try to fulfill these desires, these desires can never be fulfilled. Because desires come upon us like the ocean. There is no limit to the extent to which one could go to fulfill one's own desires. So that's the law of nature. And that's how this whole world is made. A devotee understands that. But a non-devotee, you know, gets caught up in this whole illusion of trying to, you know, get more and more and more and he becomes so frustrated. And we see even in spiritual circles how it is that you know, a person is not in proper control of their senses, they get so much agitated when they see that somebody has not, has not uh, behaved in the way in which they would like them to behave. And a very typical example is Durvas Muni. Now, actually Durvas Muni was a great sage you know, who had access right up to Vaikuntha Loka. And on the self-same body, you could actually go to Vaikuntha Loka. So from that point of view, we can understand that he was a person who had, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, spiritual credit. But then when he saw that Ambarish Maharaj, you know, had done a small, I mean, apparently, uh, small mistake, it actually was not a mistake because he had taken the advice of the sages and the sages had told him that it was perfectly all right to be drinking some water. But because he felt, Durvas Muni felt that his own false ego was affected, you know, immediately he brought out this terrible demon to kill Ambarish Maharaj. So that somehow or the other I have to try and protect my false ego. And similarly we see also Lord Indra when he was seeing that how Prithu Maharaj was performing his Ashwamedha Yagyas, 
and then you know from 1 to 2 to 3 to 99 Ashwamedha Yagyas and Indra who was the performer of 100 Ashwamedha Yagyas when he saw that his title to this 100 Ashwamedha Yagyas was being threatened he immediately becomes so fearful and then somehow the other he wants to see to it that Maharaj Prithu does not perform this 100th Ashwamedha Yagya and, there was, and we all know the story how he takes on so many different roles in order to come and you know take charge of this horse and finally Lord Brahma had to intervene and come and tell Prithu Maharaj that you know it's okay there's no need for you to perform this 100th Ashwamedha Yagya it's better that Lord Indra let him hold this title of performance performer of this 100th Ashwamedha Yagyas you know so this is this, you know, just that fear that my power and my prestige would be affected. Actually, Indra is also a devotee of the Lord. And Indra has had so many different, I mean, experiences in the past where his false ego had been crushed. But yet, time and again, you know, for our own uh, knowledge, you know, we, he time and again performs his pastimes in, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Just so for us to understand that even though we might be holding such a, you know, position of being the king of the heaven, still we are, we can be vulnerable to all these attacks of false ego if you're not, if you're not careful. But on the other hand, we see from the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam how devo devotees of the Lord are completely fearless. So many different examples, you know, and one particular example that comes to my mind is that of Vritrasura. Now, Vritrasura was not an ordinary demon. He was actually Maharaj Chitraketu in his previous life. And he had been cursed by Mother Parvati to become a demon like Vritrasura and a very, very fearsome demon. And Vritrasura was because he was a pure devotee of the Lord, he had the knowledge that actually he was going to be killed by Indra. And he also knew that the weapon that Indra possessed, the thunderbolt, was actually created out of the bones of Dadichi. And it is very interesting how in this fight between Vritrasura and Indra, Vritrasura is the one who is actually telling Indra that, you know, kill me. Why are you hesitating to kill me? I am going to die. I know I am going to die. And this particular weapon that you have, which has been empowered by Lord Vishnu, that is a weapon that is going to be used to kill me. I know that. And here, Vritrasura makes a very powerful statement. He says, no one except the Supreme Lord is guaranteed to be always victorious. No one except the Supreme Lord is guaranteed to be always victorious. And sometimes we see that even when we come into Krishna consciousness and we want to, you know, we want to do so many services for uh, Sila Prabhupada and the movement and, and Lord Krishna, at times we get carried away into thinking that whatever we are doing, we are always going to be emerging victorious. So even devotees of the Lord sometimes quite often they encounter situations where actually for their own purification Krishna puts them in such a situation that they are completely smashed and this is actually good for us this is good for our own advancement in our Krishna consciousness that at times although we might be doing our service we find that people are not appreciating our service people are thinking that we are actually hampering their performance or their, uh, their, their, their own service to Lord Krishna. We are coming in the way of their service. And sometimes over a period of time, we actually start thinking that, you know, we are the controllers. Even within the realm of Krishna consciousness, we think that we are the controllers. And this is so dangerous for our Krishna consciousness. The moment we come to that stage, where we think that we are the controllers and we are trying to perform our, our responsibilities, trying to put others down. So that is the time when we are actually in the most dangerous situation. So here is Vritrasura telling Indra that 
finally I'm going to die. It's only a matter of time. So why don't you kill me? Actually, Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport that the mood of a devotee is that he wants to somehow the other in the service of the Lord give up his life. Whereas Indra, who was actually wanting to kill Vitrasra just in order to facilitate his own sense gratification, is actually going to be continuing on in this material world. But a devotee doesn't care. He doesn't care whether he's alive or dead so far as he is performing his duties and responsibilities in Krishna consciousness. Similarly, we see also in the pastime of Sila Prabhupada, how fearless he was when he was getting this land in Jew. Now, if you read this particular pastime in the Lilamrath, it's so amazing. Now, Sila Prabhupada had seen this piece of land, I mean, four and a half acres of land, which Sila Prabhupada at that time paid about 14 or 15 lakhs of rupees, which I was just discussing a couple of weeks back with a member from the ISKCON Bureau. They had recently valued this land at around 200 crores. What Sila Prabhupada in 1970 had paid 14 lakhs, today is worth, at a very conservative estimate, around 200 crores of rupees. So I don't know how many times appreciation that is. Several, more than, more than a thousand times appreciation, right? But Sila Prabhupada had the vision at that time that, you know, this land I should acquire. I mean, he could have been content with this apartment that they had in Akash Ganga and right in the heart of the city. And all his disciples, they were actually saying that this is the place where, should be, where we should be living. And Juhu is such a far off place. And in 1970, Juhu was actually beyond the outer limit of Bombay. Uh, the outer limit of Bombay at that time was Dadar. You know, anything beyond Dadar was not considered to be Bombay at all. Like now we consider anything beyond Virar is not part of Bombay. <laughs> anything beyond Dadar was not considered to be Bombay. It was some other world. And there Sila Prabhupada, who actually had seen this piece of land as he was taking a morning walk through that particular place and he had liked that piece of land. Sila Prabhupada was completely determined to get that land for Krishna. And then when he comes across this Mr. N, who was determined right from day one to cheat Sila Prabhupada, he had already cheated a company earlier from this piece of land. And he had come to Sila Prabhupada only with the motive of cheating him. And this particular person was a very prominent personality. He was not, he was not just like you and me, you know, some ordinary people staying here in Bombay, a very, very prominent personality. Now, with tremendous political contacts and tremendous contacts with the police, and Sila Prabhupada had no clue that this person was of such a, of such a background. But anyway, Sila Prabhupada entered into this agreement to purchase this land, and then he entrusted this into the care of the devotees, and then he told the devotees to go on to the land, and, and the devotees, you know, they started staying on the land. Then after some time, the devotees were finding that this condition, or this, the, the, the the, the living conditions in, uh, the, in, on the Juhu land were so, so pathetic. You know, mosquitoes and rats and cockroaches and snakes. That they wrote to Sila Prabhupada saying that Sila Prabhupada, it's very difficult for us to continue over here. We would like to go back to our apartment in Akash Ganga. And at that time, Sila Prabhupada made this very, very historic statement to them. Wouldn't you like to get purified? So the spiritual master understands what is necessary for us to get purified in our own advancement in our Krishna consciousness. At times we are pretty much laid back and uh, you know coasting along in this in the beautiful river of Krishna consciousness thinking that you know we can just go along with the tide. Right? There are so many others who are practicing Krishna, so we, Krishna consciousness so we can just tag along with them and be along with them and we will also make our advancement in Krishna consciousness. Right? But at times the spiritual master sees that this person requires some extra special mercy, uh, extra purification in order for him to make some further advancement in his own Krishna consciousness. And the spiritual master knows and, and he gives service to you according to that particular assessment that he has made of you. And then we see how devotees, you know, when they are entrusted with responsibilities by Sila Prabhupada, you know, over the years, at the time when Sila Prabhupada was here on the planet, 
how much they blossomed in their own Krishna consciousness. Like when Srila Prabhupada wanted to construct this Krishna Balram guest house and uh, Krishna Balram temple in Vrindavan, and there was actually nobody to be doing this construction. So he approach, approached Gurudas and Yamuna and told them that, please, I request you to go to Vrindavan and, and start the construction of the Krishna Balram temple. And Srila Prabhupada tells them that I know that you are not qualified for this purpose. You don't have any construction experience. But you just be sincere. And if you are sincere, Krishna will reward you with all the facilities in order to do this service for him. And Gurudas and Yamuna take up this challenge and you know, we all know this from the pages of the Lilam breath, how it is that you know, just you know, in Bombay, it is difficult for a foreigner to survive. I want to talk about in Vrindavan. You know, they would be cheated by the local people. Actually, daylight robbery, something that would cost 10 rupees, they would charge 100 rupees and, you know, these people wouldn't even know. And at every stage, Srila Prabhupada had to be guiding them and telling them that this is what you're supposed to do. And so many delays in the construction of the Krishna Balram temple and Srila Prabhupada was so patient, you know. So here in Bombay, the devotees were getting so much harassed by all these external factors over there. And, and then they told Srila Prabhupada that, you know, we don't want to continue on this land. But Srila Prabhupada told them, please, I want you to stay over there. And I have kept these deities, Radha Ras Bihari. And I promised them that I shall build a beautiful temple for them. So Mr. N was trying his level best to somehow or the other evict the devotees out from there. And then Srila Prabhupada, so um, the devotees were really getting frustrated and then they were, they were thinking that, you know, this N is such a powerful person that uh, he could actually harm us that if we continue to leave over here. And then they, uh, they wrote to Srila Prabhupada saying that, you know, there's no point in us continuing over here. We would like to terminate the sales agreement that we have already signed with this Mr. N. And Mr. N, Mr. Uh, and uh, Srila Prabhupada at the time was actually in Ahmedabad and, uh, you know, he was conducting a Pandal program over there and Srila Prabhupada wrote back to them saying that under no circumstance should you cancel this sales agreement. But the devotees were getting so much overwhelmed by whatever was going on over there, that they all got together and decided that the best course of action would be to cancel this sales agreement. And then they did that. And then they phoned up Srila Prabhupada and then Srila Prabhupada said, now everything is finished. Whatever I had set out to do, there is nothing more that can be done. So, but still Srila Prabhupada did not give up hope. And then he entered into a new sales agreement and and uh, he sent some more devotees to Bombay. And then Srila Prabhupada personally came to uh, Hyderabad where he was having a preaching program. And then here he called Mr. N to come to Hyderabad. And in fact, Mr. N happened to be in Hyderabad at that time. And then they met and then they, had, they drafted a new sales agreement. A very beautiful pastime, you know, how Srila Prabhupada um, interacts with N who had come with his guru, you know. So, and even after the new sales agreement was executed, or you know, immediately after the new sales agreement was executed, then still Mr. N was not cooperating. And then Srila Prabhupada had to come to Bombay and there was such a vicious argument between Srila Prabhupada. I mean, here is a great saint. You know, what, what business does he have fighting with this, with this demon? And Srila Prabhupada engaged in such a debate with him and, uh, you know, this person said that you people are from the CIA and, you know, I, I don't want you on my property and you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you people are thinking that this land belongs to you, you're the owner of this land. And immediately Srila Prabhupada stopped him and said, we are not the owners of land, Lord Krishna is the owner of the land. So powerful Srila Prabhupada's immediate response that we are not the owners of the land, Lord Krishna is the owner of the land. And then within two weeks after that, Mr. N departed from this mortal world. <laughs> we don't know where he went, but he went from here. 
and everybody thought that now you know things would happen in a proper way in the juhu land but it was not to be mrs n continued the fight and then you know we all know how this bulldozers came and this demolition squad and and this political personality you know how he helps sila prabhupad so much of agyata sukriti you know that he performed just by this one telephone call that he made to this municipal commissioner telling him to stop the demolition right we don't want to name him but you know actually it was my realization that all the uh, success that this person subsequently received was only because of that small service that he did to radha ras bihari tremendous service and just one telephone call was adequate for the whole demolition to be stopped right and then after that there was a huge publicity that was created by sila prabhupad he himself was driving everything he said go on and tell the newspapers tell all the media people that this is what mrs n is actually doing you know so the whole plan backfires on mrs n and her and then she comes and falls at the feet of sila prabhupad and starts crying and she surrenders now which person would ever have so much guts to fight such a strong personality like mr n you know here is a 75 year old man i mean from a physical point of view he had absolutely no resources he had a bunch of disciples who were not even knowing what they were doing right who had no intentions or who had who had no desire to stay in that particular place they actually wanted to let go and give it back to mr n so that they could get a chance to come back and stay in this akash ganga apartment but and sila prabhupad you know single handedly was pushing there was nobody else who would, was actually supporting sila prabhupad he was single handedly pushing to get this juhu land absolutely fearless so when we are finally when you are doing something for lord krishna lord krishna empowers us you know although we might be on our own insignificant we may not be capable of doing anything but we are having the conviction that we are doing this as a service to krishna satsurup maharaj writes in the lilamrit that sila prabhupad had this conviction that he was doing this for radha ras bihari he had given this promise to radha ras bihari that he'll build a beautiful temple for them in juhu and he wanted to fulfill that promise and secondly he knew that bombay was a gateway to india it was the most prominent city in the whole country of india and to have a temple here in bombay meant that iskon and krishna consciousness would flourish within india so sila prabhupada was completely focused and convinced and lord krishna reciprocated with him and then today what we can see this beautiful temple that has come up over there in juhu so we'll we'll end now it's already 9:20 Uh, we want are there any questions grantraj shrimad bhagavatam ki sila prabhupada ki ja